morning. <laughs> morning for the frosty morning. <laughs> frosty yeah, morning. Yeah, cold. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Let's Keep Chatting. I'm Lisa and this is Elric and we're from Five Centre for our qualities. And hi there, how's it going? I'm just checking the sound is fine. It's working okay, so good stuff. Good stuff, you have And today we're chatting with Morag Coleman from Families First in St Andrews. Hi there, Morag. Hello. Good morning. How are you both? Doing well. Getting there, cold. <laughs> 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 the podcast is about community groups or organisations from around five. We're chatting about people. Sorry, <coughs> I've got a tickly throat there. Uh -huh. uh, we're chatting. Ab we're chatting about pe uh, people who are helping different equality groups and are dealing with poverty and how they are coping with the COVID nineteen situation. Yeah, so this is a podcast, so obviously we mainly record the audio, but uh, we also record the video so we can put it on YouTube and people can click on subtitles and CC for subtitles. Okay. Thank you. Good stuff. Okay, so let's chat about Family First Andrews. Morag, can you tell us a little about what you do within the organisation and uh, what the role is of the group? Yeah, sure. Um, Families First is based in St Andrews, but we cover the whole of North East Fife in our service delivery. We're very lucky to be based in St Andrews because we have a great volunteer population to our, to our availability um, through the university students. Um, and because we work with children and young people, um, they're, they're very keen to support vulnerable children and young people in our community um, and it works well for them and it works well for us because they get work experience and we get to be able to deliver a service to children and young people between the age of 5 and 16 who need additional support. It could be due to disability but they also have additional support needs such as, well they have some have autism, some are living in poverty, some are isolated because of the rural location of where they live, um, mm -hmm. some are living in circumstances where there may be substance misuse in the house um, and so there are lots of different circumstances that the children and young people get referred to us. We get referrals from um, lots of local authority agencies in the main we get the referrals from health social work and education because they know that we can support a child's social and emotional development um, mm -hmm. by offering the services that we do so we're not crossing any other service by um, you know offering although we offer men, uh, so emotional development it's more about their emotional well-being than actual mm -hmm. mental health services um, so we can be that preventative service that stops them getting to mental health services. Because around, they have, sorry. sorry uh, around what age groups then, you, you, you would say? Uh, like Between the volunteers or the service users? The service users, yeah. They're between 5 and 16 years of age. 5 and 16, um, all right, okay. Boys and girls, um, so um, yeah and the volunteers are really good at um, show, giving the children and young people new opportunities and being there for them and our actual volunteers are probably the majority are under 25 i would say between 18 and 25 we do have some other local people who volunteer for us our board of trustees have to be made up of local people that either live or work in st andrews um, but they bring with them a different skill set in their expertise and experience. Um, whilst the volunteers that help with the service delivery mm -hmm. bring use and enthusiasm and lots of different experience because they come from all over the world. Mm -hmm. how, you, um, how have you been coping since March last year? You know, has there been an increase in referrals getting sent to you for children that are needing help? Um, I wouldn't say there's been an increase in referrals. We've had a, we, we, it's been about the same number of referrals, 
but we were very responsive right from the beginning and we could step in but the first thing we did was contact all of our service users to see what they needed um, mm -hmm. and then we built developed our services depending on their need um, we were really lucky we're so well known locally with local business and with local um, voluntary sector agencies and with some trusts and grant funders so they let us know if there were funds available to help relieve poverty um, Morrison's was so good they made up food parcels for us um, that we could go and doorstep um, we, we broke it up into areas in North East Fife so we had the East Mute we had um, the central part of um, North East Fife and we had the uh, uh, going towards Tabridge Head and Dundee mm -hmm. we split the areas into three of North East Fife and each week we were able to deliver food parcels to 10 people 10 families within those um, areas um, so that was really helpful because it really brought and and when I say food parcels it was two or three bags per person per family um, it wasn't just a, a box of tea and a, and a packet of biscuits or anything it it was they were jam-packed full of fresh and um, off-the-shelf produce so we were really grateful for that and then other charities started to hear we were doing those doorstep delivery so they say do you want some um, toiletries to go in with the food parcels and so you know we built established networks that way and we were really grateful to the local people supporting local people really so when you say um, additional support needs it's just to, to understand it better so is it, it's uh, younger people but with uh, disability but not just disability yeah. So it, it could be a range of additional support needs, yes. but but you would say that a protected characteristic of disability really that's yes. ma mainly yeah. who you work with. Yeah, we have we I mean we accept anybody into service, so there's no barriers to people accessing our service. And as I say, it could be from isolation and loneliness through to disability, and anything in between. And and you know, people could be. Um, thinking about their sexual orientation and all kinds of things that when we get referred people often say it's behavioural or isolation mm -hmm. but once we get to know our service users and we they, we've established a trusting relationship with them we get to learn a lot more about what brings them to us um, and so it could go deeper than just behavioural there's there's always something behind the behaviour and that's when we when once we establish a trusting relationship we get to learn more and for some people it can take two or three years to feel that they could trust someone again um mm. so we we really do there's no time limit to our service as well i should say that so mm -hmm. um as for as long as they need us we're there until they're 16 and they move on to sort of uh, miss semi adult services and other services mm -hmm. How's um, isolation? For so, how have people been coping with isolation in the rural? rural oh, I can't even get the word out. Rural. Rural areas. <laughs> rural areas. Yeah, it's all um, yeah, isolation has been huge for our service users um, because some of the reasons that children refer to us could be because of parental disability as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so they could be carers as well although that's not the main reason they refer to us um, but in amongst all that we've had quite a few children and young people and parents and carers shielding mm -hmm. and so that's been even more difficult for them um, they feel lonely and isolated and that phone call or that zoom um, group chat or whatever it might be that we offer um, yeah it breaks the monotony of their week and gives them a bit of hope it also then we can find out if they need anything and if we can be either signpost or directly mm -hmm. help as well and no. have they have they adapted well to using technology you know over the year some have some haven't and it's interesting you say that because some of our younger children don't like to use technology as much as the older ones do that's that's amazing i would just yeah. think yeah that age group you know children you know would all want to use technology kind of thing um, so at, for, in total lockdown our they enjoy the digital connection 
But as soon as we're allowed to come out of lockdown for whatever reason, what, whatever form that might take, they really do want to get back to the face-to-face -face connection. And mm -hmm. we did a survey at the end of the last lockdown um, to see what their preference was because we thought, oh, is this a whole new way to deliver services? Um, but we found that as soon as they could meet with us, they disengaged from the Zoom groups, um, right. youth groups and everything. They preferred smaller group, face-to-face, -face, just walking about town with a volunteer, that kind of thing. Um, ah, so okay. we, were able, we were able then to not provide a full youth group yet because that's too many children, young people together. Um, and we don't have the accommodation. We're, we're based in a very small building. So we um, we could offer smaller group walkabouts towns and they absolutely loved that. And as for the very young children, I think we remain more connected with them through uh, speaking to their parents, either mm -hmm. on Zoom or phone calls, or they loved um, posting pictures on Facebook to their volunteer and their volunteer would post the picture back to them. Um, mm -hmm. and so we got creative in how we did. Uh -huh that connection it didn't have to be face to face it could be whatever they felt comfortable with with yeah that makes sense so you, when you're saying small walkabouts so it's like maybe two or three it's like creating small less public. pressure le yeah. less anxiety like two or three peers kind of yes. developing friendships kind of thing, kind of yeah. work yeah right mm -hmm. um and so and and the other thing of course is because our volunteers come from all over the world we didn't have access to a lot of uh, our young volunteers in town. So mm -hmm. the staff had to take over delivering more services. It was oh, actually right. easier to connect digitally with our volunteers because they could zoom in or they could post on Facebook because from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. But actually having them in the town centre became more of a challenge. Okay, imagine. The staff had to take over that face-to-face -face delivery. Uh, the kids, the kids will be enjoying that contact, though, yeah. and everything, you know. And it probably is helping, like, them feel more of a connection to people, you know, and not have that isolation, yeah, you know. Absolutely. And um, a lot of our young people who are either show signs of autistic spectrum disorder or who um, are diagnosed with that, you know, they have a, a unique way of connecting with people and it's special to them. And mm. so whatever they choose to do to connect with people um, is OK by us. And some um, couldn't cope with the digital the, the chaos and the unknown and the uncertainty of digital connection in a Zoom call, for example, or a video okay. call. It was it was different and so it, they couldn't adjust well to that. And so by po posting pictures on Facebook or speaking with their parents, knowing they could hear in the background and join in and engage with that in a different way was fine by us. You know, we were connected. Uh, okay. with so it's kind of doing group work where the focus is on someone else, but it could yes. drop in from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what we found with our, we, we run youth groups of about um, eight young people, maybe four or five volunteers in that group. Uh, under normal circumstances, we keep our youth groups very small for that purpose so that um, they can be part of the group, but they don't have to be in the group. Mm -hmm. And very often we would have um, a couple of young people sitting on the sidelines, um, but they're in the group setting um, and you think they're not involved, but suddenly they'll pipe up and say something and, th and you think, oh, they have mm -hmm. been listening or <laughs> they have been joining in, but it's the way they choose to join in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that process, we're also developing their softer skills so that they can they can learn how to be involved in a group so that they can go to the workplace feeling a bit more confident about it doesn't have to be a whole classroom size of people you know mm -hmm. they can find work in in small settings that um, are not lots of people and there's not lots of buzz going around them so it's really introducing them to the softer skills that they would need to then to be employed mm -hmm or join college or join whatever they want to do when they're 16 plus. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what help do you like? You say that you help up to the age of sixteen. Um, I do you refer them on to say maybe another group that might be able to offer extra help yeah. for them if they're still needing it. Yeah, yeah. We work very closely with schools, as I said, and mm -hmm. usually there's a good pathway for them being developed at school anyway. Um, but if we can help in any, because we are part of the team around the child with a lot of our statutory agency partners. Um, and if there's any way at all we can help to facilitate that transition into adult services, we will do. And that could be the volunteer buddies them to something, you know, mm. into college, or they might go with their parents. But if we can help, we will. So let's talk a bit about how things are going at the moment with what we're all dealing with and it's one way or the other, not just for weather. <laughs> yes, I'm watching the weather at the back of the morning. <laughs> it's coming heavy. <laughs> it's coming heavy here as well. So, <laughs> so yeah, so, so how things, uh, how are you doing personally as the organisation How and, and yourself personally, how are things that way? Um, well, as you know, for any voluntary sector organisation, funding's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that our funders have been particularly good at understanding the changes we've had to make. So we may not have met all of our key performance indicators, mm -hmm. um, but we've been creative in how we maintain connection with the children and young people and ensure that they've been supported. And that's been our key priority is to know that they're safe and well and have enough food and heat and light and whatever you need the basic needs so we've established, we've ensured that they um that they remain safe and then the connection the social activity has been good but i have to say the staff really miss each other as well as an organization we miss miss that connection it makes it hard for organizations to operate in the sense that you can't just say to your colleague sitting next door to you hey what about this what do you think about this it involves a phone call it involves a whole process of thinking and then coming back to each other which mm -hmm. would probably took about 10 minutes had you been together but we've worked around that you know so i think that i think now the whole country is feeling quite isolated don't you and just want to get back to normal yeah i think yeah. with the vaccination roll roll out at the moment you know it's it's like seeing a light at the end of the tunnel even though it might take a wee bit long to get there but at least it's there yeah. to get back to some kind of normality yeah mm. so we've been yeah we've been really protective of the staff as well and considered their needs in all of this and we were lucky to get funding to get um laptops for everybody so they could work from home um mm. everybody's got an internet connection the frontline staff got new mobile phones so they could be out in the community more with better technology mm -hmm. um, and it was things like that we were able to get funding for uh, which was good so the small project money was quite good and um, the longer term funding I think is well it's the same for any voluntary sector organization we have to work hard at it it's always a question yeah yeah so and so can you tell us a bit about what you might have noticed uh, over the past year now it's been a year really uh, about um, any specific groups that are having things quite difficult. It might, some, it might be with homeschooling or maybe outside of schooling. So, so I'm, I'm expecting a lot to do with what, uh, schooling from home, but there might be other aspects. And, and yeah. there's things that you touched on that we haven't talked too much to other groups about, which is about the, the semi-rural aspect of an office five by isolation. And then families that might be dealing with, as you say, uh, uh, parents who might be disabled, people that are dealing with substance, substance abuse. So, so if you can tell us a bit about what you might have noticed, say, over the past year of different groups. Yeah, I think um, everybody's confidence has bit. That's been a huge aspect. And some children and young people have really been keen to go to school. Others, mm -hmm. have, it's, it's proving more of a challenge to get back to school. So we know there's going to be as we feel there's going to be a spike in helping children and young people to get back into school, mm -hmm. um, especially those that have traditional support needs in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. But others, homeschooling has been a real challenge. Um, 
either they've not had the resources or their parents have really struggled to help them because they just don't understand the work themselves and then okay. you have this whole other aspect of parent self-esteem and feeling in inadequate as a parent because they haven't been able to support their children as they would like and that's through no fault of their own it's just circumstances that have brought us all to this point um and so i think there's a lot of social anxiety around actually physically getting back into school mm -hmm. but also the anxiety about um children and young people this gener this year this whole year is as is the lack of education that children and young people have experienced yeah and I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that some parents will be considering will we keep our children back a year um and that, that is the talk at the moment you know i've heard been reading the news and there's been talk you know uh, either no summer holidays let's just work through the summer mm -hmm. or um re reset the whole year again yeah. kind of thing you mm -hmm. know and people that i know you know that live around me are saying no i that's not fair on the teachers it's not fair on the kids mm -hmm. and everything but um the kids that you've been working with have some of them been how have some of them been going into the high in, either into the school or the high school at the moment, you know, and how they've been coping, you know, because I'm guessing it's a smaller group at the school, yeah. and they'll be feeling a bit um, anxious probably going into school. And noticing, oh, but where's everybody else? You know, why they get to stay at home while I have to go into school, kind of thing. I think for some of the children and young people that we've been working with, um, they've kind of liked the routine as well. Some of them have enjoyed going back to school. So it's helped them. It's helped them because at least they're socialising a bit. But um, for those of us, might that for those, for some of them that may be in the um, special educational needs units anyway um, mm -hmm. I think that has helped not only them but their parents as well because mm -hmm. maintaining a routine is so important for some of the children we work with and mm -hmm. having that routine is probably more important than their education um, mm -hmm. because they need to have that structure within their lives so they, they don't become as anxious then um, and that's the key thing so yes for some children young people it's really helped um and i think um for some other agencies they've requested that some of the children they work with actually go back into school as well mm, but for okay. others it's business as normal until the schools reopen so everyone's just doing the best they can and they're doing a great job under very difficult circumstances mm -hmm. yeah have that's you noticed, good have you noticed any specific impact on uh, groups with specific protected characteristics. You would say, uh, let's say some, some people that have uh, support needs through disability, you would say they are the main ones that, that are feeling that, that pressure at the moment, or it might be more young people that are living in poverty or sometimes a combination of both. So is there anything that you would have picked up on, or, or from, especially at the end of last year, I would say? Yeah, at the end of last year, during the last time we were locked down, you know, it was things like um, having extra play equipment for children in homes, mm -hmm. um, maybe outdoor kits so they could explore the outdoors a bit more. So we were able to source funding for that at that point. And then we realised that some of the children and young people that we work with wouldn't have um, decent... When we started doing um, youth groups or work in the community, we began to realise that parents and uh, carers couldn't actually afford a decent outdoor um, mm -hmm. kit for their children, so um, coats and warm trousers or whatever. So we were able to attract funds to uh, get vouchers for parents to either order online or to go to a local shop if they were open to get warm coats and uh, outdoor trousers for their children and young people. So it's as the seasons have prog progressed, we've mm -hmm. noticed that there's a new need highlighted. Um, so that's one of the things that we picked up on. Um, and of course, the, the 
the anxiety, the early sort of mental health has been another. Um, and that's something that we can support people in because I think as long as they don't need um, uh, national health intervention, mm -hmm. we can support with that early intervention of prevention. Um, and as long as they know that we're there to talk to them. And that's been for the parents as well as the children and young people. We take this holistic approach um, to supporting children and young people. Um, and we do have our family support service where we do support the adults in a child's life if they need it. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. has been crucial um, mm -hmm. as well. So without our family support service, I don't think the children and young people would have been as well supported. Um, or we could have mm -hmm. spent a lot of time supporting the parents and carers and under supporting the children and young tried, people. Yeah. Um, so it's been a good balance of holistic of, of the holistic approach we've taken that's really you, worked well for whole families. Do you do this just yourselves at Hamis yeah. First or do you work with other groups you know, like basically to support the parents at the same time? So. Yeah. We belong to the North East Fife Localities Network. I'm, I'm not sure of the exact name right now, but mm -hmm. although it's not been operational for a year, we do know a lot of our partners within the locality. Okay. Um, and you mentioned earlier about referring people on. So we use link befriending a lot um, mm -hmm. along the coast. Mm -hmm. um, so some of our young people will get referred to them when they reach 16. Um, but for others, it might be we work with Homestart to get help and um, other local um, agencies that we might know that's in the community in North East Fife. So we, we do work in partnership with a lot of other agencies. Again, with statutory services, we can refer on to them. Onto as well them. As is there anything that you would say you've noticed over the past few months that's like okay that that really worked out that you, you, you like to say it's, it's quite good because it's been quite difficult but it's quite good to have something like ah oh, this is actually this worked out this is good so is there anything like that that pops to mind that you'd like to share uh, yeah i think we've had the ability not to focus on crisis mm -hmm. only we've had the ability to maintain connections with our local partners uh, um, in the area and with our service users. And because of that, we've probably helped prevent crisis um, by getting um, help to them early on. Um, but also, yeah, I think the partnership working has worked really well, I mm -hmm. would say, and the early intervention of being, having, maintaining that connection has worked really well because we've been able to assess need early on and get the help they need where they need it most. Um, rather than it building to crisis because they don't have to talk to. Uh, that, that very often is like, okay, as I told you, do, you just need to, everyone looks in and try and solve, exactly. resolve situations. But avoiding is, it, you need to have good communications. Yes. With, yeah. uh, with the groups that you're working with, so that they actually do tell you <laughs> before it gets there. Yeah. So, yeah, that's really interesting. So, is there, is there any cap where you had to go, okay, we need to do things differently there? <laughs> uh, because there's been a lot of groups that have been forced to do it. So do, yeah. is anything that's changed in the, in the way you work, you would say? No, I think, well, the biggest change is not being able to be face to face with other <laughs> users and with each other. Um, mm. And that's been the biggest challenge for everybody, I think. Um, so that's yeah. been the biggest change. But we, with such a small team, that we were really responsive. Uh, we didn't have to um, go through a lot of bureaucracy to actually get something done. We could discuss it, risk assess it, and then do it. <laughs> and that could happen within uh, half an hour, you know, of um, needing to do something. Um, we are starting to think about um, getting back out into the community to support some of our vulnerable service users, mm -hmm. especially with their mental health. And we're risk assessing that, you know, if you stay a safe distance, you're out in the open air and you're walking and talking, what could yeah. be for mental health is to be out in the open, talking yeah. to somebody, enjoying the um, fresh air. The, we have some, we, I mean, we do live in a beautiful part of the country and we have some local facilities that are just absolutely spectacular with our beaches and countryside. And so we've been making good use of that in supporting mm -hmm. our service users as well. 
and going out to their communities to build on um, just the, even the walks and talks. That's good that you've been able to like adapt and change and, you know, just make keeping the kids feel some kind of like safe, you know, in the environment that they're having to deal with this year. It's interesting as well. One of the things that um, they, they realised very early on was that they weren't alone. They all had the same feelings. Mm -hmm. And we had it said to us quite a few times, especially when it became, you know, Zoom groups or whatever. A feedback afterwards was, I didn't realise everyone else was feeling that way too. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's just really nice to realise you're not alone in your feelings and your thoughts as well. Yeah. Because, like... If it's like thinking, oh, kids will just sort of accept what's going on, kind of thing, because the adults are sort of like showing their way, kind of they're trying to follow the adults' perception about what's going on around them. But it's not really how they're feeling, and they need that chance to say, "Well, I actually feel like this right now. You know, I need help and discuss the situation." It's, it's interesting to know that children often want to protect their parents as well. And mm -hmm. uh, think, yeah. you know, parents are thinking they're protecting their children, but children, children are also protecting the same. Parents. Yeah. And it is about encouraging them to talk with each other as well sometimes and to um, really dig deep into, you, you're saying you're okay, but you don't look okay. Do you want to tell mm -hmm. me a bit more about that? Um, and encouraging parents, it is okay to ask their children to, how they're feeling. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it takes a lot of um, a, a lot of um, courage, I think, for some families to actually ask that extra question about the, the well-being of their uh, family members. So, mm. if we can support in that way, it just starts to open up doors, um, mm -hmm. so they can get the support they need. Right. I mean, in many ways, it's not an easy situation, but we've seen that what's been happening lately has actually helped a lot of uh, groups or even, well, it doesn't matter, any service to actually change and the service users to actually think about connections that they, they yeah. didn't have before. Yeah. Yeah. And like, so starting new groups and new connections and yeah. uh, so, but have you seen that you work you're saying you're, because I'm, I'm guessing a lot of young people don't have the same peer groups that they would have at yeah. school because that's that's gone yeah. so are you seeing a bit of more mixing happening a bit more diversity of people that would normally well they would they wouldn't really necessarily be together but yeah. this situation has brought them together would you have any examples it, that you can yeah. share well under normal circumstances it's interesting that you say that because what we do is we organise our befriending nights or our youth group nights on locality mm -hmm. so that children and young people can get to meet others from their communities. So, um, excuse me, on a youth group night, we would probably bring everyone that's referred to us in from, say, the East Nuke. Um, and so when they're mi mixing and meeting together, they either realise they go to the same school or they live just down the road from each other mm -hmm. and so we've always been about that anyway is establishing new connections so that we can our ultimate goal is for not to have our service users in service that well, they yeah. independent and enjoy local activities um, and so if we can make those connections through befriending or through youth group we definitely will um, we have five partners under normal circumstances. I use this phrase a lot at the moment. Yeah. Have five partnerships in our building on a, we can have up to five partnerships in our building on any one night, but they would all come from the same, same local area. Now, some of them choose to be on their own and just work with their befriender, but others, um, they form little, almost a little use group within themselves. And so the volunteers will make arrangements together to go out with the young children. Um, and so they might go and play a game of football um, down at the beach or at the local park or a last local grassy area. And so they're starting to make connections that they wouldn't under normal circumstances have made because um, they, they don't 
actually live next door or go to the same school. So it's lovely to see these friendships formed. And you mentioned the smaller youth groups at the moment. Um, that's what they've been doing is they've been uh, securing those friendships with the three or four people they've been meeting up with. Mm, and okay. with, with the group, act, the Zoom groups have become less but more in them. So we're offering them sort of maybe twice a week, but there's more young people joining in and they are joining in. Um, they're getting to know others from mm. their community that they maybe didn't know before. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit about if someone is interested to join or a parent or maybe a young person, how, how do how do they get in touch? What what what, do, what should they do? Yeah, um, so yeah, our, we, it's a refer, referral only service, unfortunately. Okay. But that doesn't mean to say that a parent can't go and talk to the school teacher mm -hmm. or to the social worker or health visitor and they could refer us on. Okay, um, so usually from a school then? School, social work and health, I would say, are our three main referrers. Okay. Um, but sometimes it's other uh, voluntary sector organisations such as DAPL or um, uh, Home Start's a good one because they work not to five. Okay. So then if they have a family that still needs support, they'll refer to us. Um, they complete the referral form and then we make an assessment based on that. We have to assess risk. Um, we have to protect our young volunteers and we have to protect our organisation because some children and young people, if their behaviours are too risky, mm -hmm. we can't support them. We don't have the qualified staff that we would need to do that. Um, so once we've assessed the referral, we will then um, put them on our waiting list and we have a huge waiting list, I have to say. It's mm. always huge. That has not changed through COVID. Um, okay. It's it's just that we're, people are always demanding our service. I know. And so how, oh, I was just going to say, okay. how do you get involved, you know, if you, because you talk about uh, student volunteers, um, we have to, we're always, we advertise on five voluntary action website, but word of mouth is the biggest thing that um, we've, we've surveyed that and it's always word of mouth. Oh, my friend volunteers for you. They say you're such a great organisation. Can I volunteer mm -hmm. to <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we had to do, we had to actually in the end put it down to two recruitment drives a year because it was taking up so much time to um, explain ourselves to people and then go through the whole recruitment process. So we tend to do it in the autumn and the spring. The spring lets us get volunteers ready for the starting in the autumn. Mm -hmm. And the autumn um, volunteers are usually ready by about mid-November because they, they come to a volunteer information meeting. Um, we tell them about families first. They get to decide whether we're the organisation they want to volunteer with and get uh, learn new skills from. If they're keen, then they complete the application. They have to have police checks. They have to do, um, I think, four or five basic training modules that we, we deliver. Once all their police checks, their references and their training is done, we hope that's kind of running along in tandem. So mm -hmm. that at the end of about six or seven weeks, they're ready to go um, because everything's back at the same time. Um, and so that's how they start. And we, we always um, uh, we always have experienced volunteers involved in some of that process. But we also, um, we never put a brand new volunteer with someone that we feel would pr prove a challenge to them. We don't want to lose them, so we want to support them in their volunteering journey with us. Mm -hmm. When we do recruit, we usually have them for three or four years until they graduate or leave town or move on. Um, and they're offered support the whole way through that. Um, and the more experience they get, then we might put them with a child that has more complex needs. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a, it's a learning journey for them. Um, and also, but some, some young people stay with the same child for the whole four years, three years. Um, because they have established such a good bond and relationship. And we encourage that in terms of not creating dependency, but in terms of resilience. Um, we know that trusting lasting relationships help to build resilience in especially young people. 
it gives them the skills that they need to then be an, a, a quite a confident adult. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to develop people's resilience as well. So in, encourage long lasting relationships. But we support Wait. the whole way. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to ask, um, when you get the volunteers, do you sort of try and match them to the service users that you feel they might be able to help more? Yeah, because we're, we're in that um, recruitment phase, we're assessing their skills and abilities as well. But one of the questions we ask the children, young people and the volunteers is, what are your interests and hobbies? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we wouldn't put um, a child that has ADHD, for example, with someone who enjoys computers and books. Um, we would put, probably put them with someone that enjoys sports um, so that they're out and about with them, burning off energy and enjoying the physical activities. So we do carefully match. Uh, we've never, I think in the whole, t I've been with Families First since 2011 now, and I've never had to rematch someone yet because of the careful selection process. We've had to support a couple of volunteers in how to manage a child's behaviour and that's been more productive in maintaining the relationship and also um, teaching people to be able to manage certain situations. That's been more helpful to them over the years than actually saying, OK, that's not working. Let's give you someone new. It's about problem solving as well, helping people to mm -hmm. problem solve. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So is that what you you would see as your, your call out over time? But technically, well, you're recruiting <laughs> volunteers, yeah? At least. We're always recruiting, recruiting volunteers. Volunteers, yeah. trustees. Everybody's always recruiting trustees. But actually, you know, we, do, we, take, we take seriously, our board of trustees takes seriously their roles and responsibilities. But they also like to have a good mix of skills and expertise on the board. Um, and if I'm going to do a call out now, it's we need um, trustees with expertise in social work and finance and legal aspects. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's I'm anybody out that. there listening that would like to become a trustee and lives and works in Northeast Fife, please give us a call. All our okay. details are on our website. That sounds good. Make sure to share that. Yeah, yeah so, so I, I guess it must be odd. Uh, training volunteers remotely at the moment <laughs> but it's, it's something we've really struggled with um we have been lucky in securing um some funds to get some help within the organization around our uh, sort of digital um presence and so mm -hmm. we've, we've we've built a new website but it needs further work um but we haven't had the capacity within our team to follow that through but we've got a bit of money now and we will be recruiting a digital intern soon. Um, and one of the things I want them to help us with is to get our training online. Mm. But for me, to assess someone to work with a vulnerable child, I like to see them face to face and assess. Yeah. Them. And that's been a real challenge because I wouldn't put someone I haven't even met face to face with someone that has additional support needs of course, um, yeah, and so although we've been making do this year we know we've got to face that challenge head on <laughs> this year because we'll end up with no volunteers everyone's going to graduate and we won't have a, we have a, a um, an attrition rate of that we have we have about 80 volunteers volunteer with us and every year we lose about i would say a third of that but we also recruit mm -hmm. a third of that as well so it okay. always has worked out up until now but what we know is we have lost some volunteers to graduation um and we haven't recruited them in we have mm -hmm. a waiting list waiting to be recruited in but it is that training aspect that has proved a challenge for me um and i want everybody to be safe i don't want to put anyone at risk in mm -hmm. doing what we're doing and the assessment process for me has been about up until now has been about meeting people that assess that when they're going through their training, we're assessing their skills and abilities the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's been our biggest challenge, I would say, is to appropriately recruit and train suitable mm -hmm. volunteers to meet the needs of our children and young people. I'm guessing the next stage is 
volunteers might be a bit afraid about, well, I need to be vaccinated and families might be asking the same thing. So th there's that coming in, into yeah. play now as well. So that, that's yeah. going to be, well, not just you, that's going to affect every single right. organization with volunteers or, or not. But yeah, that's definitely the next few months. Okay, so make sure to mention the call ad. That's definite. Yeah. So um, is the website the best way to find your details? The new website and the new yeah. website it's it's a work in progress um please bear with us on that um <laughs> but it has links to our facebook um and twitter uh, and instagram pages as well on embedded in the page so um we're very active on facebook we're still learning about instagram and twitter so <laughs> Um, please, I think if I was saying anything now, please phone. <laughs> or, um, Talk to someone, that'd be great. Yeah. Phone, email. So I hear or, that voice. <laughs> <laughs> or um, Facebook is the best way to get us. So Twitter and Instagram, we're a bit new out just now. So um, we're there's a lot of us. Yeah. yeah. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make sure to share that. So that's us coming to the end of uh, our interview today. So thanks, Morag, for telling us all about Family First at Andrews. And if there's any trustees out there, anybody that would like to become a trustee with Family First, you know, get in contact, you know, and help the group out and everything. So just like to end the day and say again, thank you. So. And that's us finish for the day. Oh, thank you for being on uh, the podcast. Hope you yes. stay warm. Hope you stay yes. warm. Yes. Been lovely speaking to you. Get it.